Welcome to episode 10 of BCG's Health Tech Videos. I am Ariel Rothman, and today's moderator is Jose Rodriguez, Managing Director and Partner at BCG. I'm excited to introduce today's panelists, who are here to discuss data and AI in life science manufacturing. Martin Perman is the co-founder of Invert, and Dan Shaik is the Director of Innovation and Technology at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Thank you both so much for joining. I'll pass it off to Jose now to begin the discussion. Excellent. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us. It's great to have you today uh, and great to have two experts to talk to us about life science uh, and AI uh, in manufacturing. So I'll just start with, you know, what are you guys seeing out there? Uh, how can life science companies enhance the value in manufacturing using AI? And what is already happening today? And what are you excited about? What can what is possible in the future? The reality is every value chain, irrespective of industry, can benefit from optimization and automation. Now, in terms of life sciences, for example, you can look at inventory management. AI can optimize your inventory, thereby increasing liquidity, reducing cash to cash cycles, and having a material positive impact on business. But it continues. If you look at the production process itself, AI can identify the likelihood of a deviation so there's an opportunity to remediate any of those complications, thereby increasing efficiency, maintaining customer satisfaction or increasing customer satisfaction, and once again, having a, a positive uh, impact on the bottom line. So in terms of what we see today, much of what I've described is in flight today in some form or fashion. But what really excites me is the evolution or where AI systems are going. If you look today, most systems are closed in nature. They're focused on a particular problem set or a particular domain. They don't interact with externalities. But that's starting to change if you look at retrieval augmented systems. And that eventually, I believe, will lead to an interconnected systems of AI. And why that's so exciting to me is today, AI systems identify local maxima or local optimizations. Mm -hmm. But through this interconnection, what will happen is global maximas or global optimizations can be identified. Global automations can be achieved. And that's going to create a whole new tier of benefits and value. And so to me, that's incredibly exciting. It sounds super exciting that I would agree with that. Martin, tell us a little bit from your perspective. What are you seeing? Uh, tell us a bit about your company and then how your company is helping life science companies get the value of AI. Yeah, thank you so much. What we do over at Invert, where I'm the co-founder and the CEO, is we help life sciences companies optimize their bioprocessing. Uh, that we do that in R&D, and we do that all the way through production for therapeutics companies and for um, industrial biotech companies. Uh, so naturally, that's where I see the most potential. But I, to Dan's point, I think it is entirely the case that it's, it's almost impossible to to sort of throw a rock into the uh, the life sciences supply chain and not see an opportunity for AI to, uh, to increase bottom lines quite significantly. In terms of what we are the most excited about in the short term, I believe uh, Dan hit it right on the nail when he said that um, if we look at the manufacturing shop floor as a, as a series of, of um, unit operations with some sort of a flow sheet describing it, there's complexities all the way down in every single unit operation there process controls that can go awry, um, anomalies that can be detected or not. And the state of affairs currently is that we look at those very sort of individually, but what we think is coming in the very short term and, uh, and near term or short term here likely means single digit years is optimization across that whole production line. Uh, we believe that things like predictive um, maintenance and scheduling for the furthest downstream operations um, can be much, much optimized already uh, early in the upstream. Uh, things like uh, staffing schedules, things like uh, supply chain ordering, things like lot releases, all these things uh, we're seeing a lot of um, a lot of optimization potential in. That's super exciting. And I can relate to that when I work with clients in the pharmaceutical manufacturing space, for example, uh, that ability to anticipate what's coming and react sooner uh, would be super powerful and super valuable uh, to them. One thing that, I mean, I have to ask because it's all over, as you guys know, is kind of the role of generative AI in this space. What are your thoughts about this? Is this uh, an area of application for JI, uh, Gen AI into the future? 
maybe Martin, you want to start? When you talk about generative AI here, specifically as a separate uh, branch from, from sort of more traditional uh, machine learning, to Dan's earlier point, I think it's correct to think of it as uh, human cognition, but multiplied quite a bit. So the types of questions that we like to, end, to ask ourselves internally is, what would our customers do if they had an unlimited number of data scientists available or an unlimited number of bioprocess engineers or, or molecular biologists or, um, or any other of these roles? And so what we're very excited about in the short term is using natural language processing that parses um, questions from process engineers as the process is happening uh, from natural language into Python or some other data science language that then goes and queries the historical data, comes back with an answer without going first through a data science division that needs to understand the problem at hand that typically aren't biotechnical in the sense that uh, they have sort of immediate answers here. And getting that feedback loop really, really short of enabling the non-data science technical team members to basically become data scientists. That's something we uh, are already beginning to see and, and, and both we're expecting to really take off in the next year or two. That sounds amazing. What about you, Dan? What are, what are your thoughts on Gen AI in this space? I think Gen AI can and is going to be very helpful in terms of going back to the value chain, right? There's applications throughout. Uh, and one of the most interesting aspects of Gen AI, and I'm, I'm sure we'll touch upon this, is it has the ability to democratize access to AI. And this is what Martin was, was touching upon. You no longer necessarily need that data science background, that machine uh, learning background to extrapolate or extract some understandings or lessons or intelligence, you can leverage Gen AI for that. And that can be done across the value chain, be that in manufacturing, in sales and support, whatever have you. And so there's many use cases for Gen AI. So I'm, I'm excited about what is out there. There are some more lower hanging fruits that I think will obviously be tackled, uh, you know, in terms of answering basic questions, in terms of orders, in terms of batches, in terms of the actual manufacturing process. And you can even start seeing it apply to different contracts and things of that nature. So that's where it's going to start. But by its very nature, how it it makes the whole process of AI and the insights more accessible, I think it's going to really change how we interact with, with AI and how we're able to leverage those optimizations and automations. So it's very exciting. That's amazing. Uh, let me ask you a different question. Uh, when I work with clients in this space, we inevitably come back to the question about data, right? So all these tools that have advanced analytics capabilities that have um, opportunities to drive optimization and automation rely on some level of data and clients struggle with making that data available, ensuring the quality of that data. What are your thoughts there? What do we need to do from a data infrastructure perspective to make these solutions a reality? Data infrastructure needs to be robust, reliable, resilient, and agile. If you recall earlier in our conversation, I mentioned that AI is a vehicle for optimization and automation. Now that vehicle is fueled by data. If you don't have data or high quality data, that vehicle isn't going anywhere. And I'm sure where most of us, if not all of us have heard the phrase, data is a new oil. Now I'm fond of that statement and phrase for two reasons. First, it highlights the value of data. Data is as valuable as oil, if not more. But the other and just as important reason is it highlights the nature of data. Like oil, data is usually latent within an ecosystem and must be extracted. Data like oil has value in its raw form, but its highest value is only realized after it undergoes an engineering process. Mm. So in order for AI systems or AI vehicles to really drive towards these destinations of value, data infrastructures need to supply a steady, reliable feed of data fuel. And until those data products are readily accessible, AI is not going to, to reach its potential. Yeah, the, the value of data, I think, in generative AI when it comes to the, the life sciences supply chain um, varies a lot across that supply chain. If we think about uh, molecule discovery, which we just talked about, we're seeing a lot of progress very fast in things like generative models for protein design. 
And that's possible because there's training corpuses available publicly uh, that, that um, involve a lot of sequencing data that exists out there in the world. If you think about something like, um, let's say, um, the act of growing Cho to uh, express some sort of product, that data, those time series that describe that process uh, from T0 through to uh, through the harvest doesn't exist in any training corpus. Uh, biopharma companies historically don't publish that data. They have no reason to. It's really hard to patent, so it's all trade secrets. And so for that reason, it's really hard for, for companies coming from the outside to get good uh, at training on that type of data. So to sort of your customers, what I think is the uh, right approach is begin investing heavily in getting your data readiness up. That means make sure that you have easy pathways to getting data off of instruments, make sure that everything does get saved, even things that don't feel like data, um, sort of human generated uh, pros is a thing that often gets tossed away, but probably should be uh, saved because to, to a machine that is data. Um, and begin putting yourself in a position where you're sort of AI ready to the point that you can then start training historically across that um, across that data set. I think that's what we'll uh, have to see over the next uh, many years. Yeah, I love those answers. I think one of the things that I heard in both of your comments that resonates with me is there's a technical aspect of data. And then there's also like a cultural aspect of data about understanding its value and therefore reinforcing the behaviors about taking care of it and making sure that, you know, we have the right data governance processes, that we pay attention to the quality of the data on an ongoing basis. It's like a, a never ending endeavor uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that you have the right data to power these uh, very amazing solutions. Well, let's move on to another question. Um, as, we, as we think about this space, one thing I was reflecting on is, it's not atypical for me to work with clients and see that they have a lot of proof of concepts, a lot of minimal viable products, a lot of prototypes, but not necessarily a lot of places where they can point to, here is a place where we're deploying artificial intelligence at scale. So I guess that's my question for you guys. What, what do you think will take um, to actually see the deployment and the acceleration of adoption of artificial intelligence at scale? First of all, I think it's important to stress here that um, AI, as we talk about it today, is a relatively new technology or, or is, um, it, it's a new phenomenon that is readily available. Life sciences manufacturing, for very good reasons, is a heavily regulated and fairly conservative industry. And so for that reason, um, I'm not surprised nor really dismayed that we're not seeing more widespread adoption this early in the cycle. I, I, I'd almost be a little um, scared if that was the case. Mm. Um, in terms of where it's easy to make or easier to make headway, uh, we talk a lot internally and with customers about um, areas like process development in which uh, you're uh, ideally not making doses for uh, that are going to go into humans yet or into patients, uh, which means that you can be a little bit more uh, experimental in how you approach things. You can ideally save a lot of time, save yourself a lot of experiments, figuring out how to search the, the cube of possible experiments to design your optimal manufacturing process. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of, of AI already being applied there um, in things like what I just described in terms of using uh, natural language to generate very complex um, ML models that then answer questions like uh, uh, questions about production of different uh, biomolecules in, in a cell. Uh, I suspect that we will see it next also in a lot of formulation work, uh, both, both media formulation and, and, and downstream formulation work. Uh, in which we're beginning to see some of these foundation models in chemistry come online in a way that uh, can, to Dan's Dan's earlier point, act like a lot of of uh, biochemists working in parallel and just getting answers uh, faster. And so I think time to market is really where we'll see uh, the most value in the short term. I think what's really going to drive adoption, and particularly adoption at scale and accelerating that adoption, is going to be democratization of AI and data. And, and what I mean by that is helping all members of an organization have a fundamental understanding of what AI is, what are its requirements, what are its capabilities, what are its limitations, and similarly its relationship with data. Once again, what is data? What are its requirements? What is its nature? 
And so then people can be AI smart, can be data smart. And the reason that becomes important is when you have different subject matter experts spread across an organization, when they start discussing opportunities or use cases where AI can help them, that can optimize or automate, that's really going to drive grassroots conversations. So ideal opportunities are going to be surfaced. And once they're surfaced, they're going to be strategically discussed. Then there's going to be strategic planning. Then there's going to be strategic execution. And then there's going to be value. And it's going to turn into this virtuous cycle. As more people discuss, as more value is identified and harvested, they're going to want to do it more. And, and so then the cycle is going to continue and continue. And that's how we're going to accelerate to a wider uh, adoption. Yeah, I see your point, Dan. And I I, I, I think of just my personal experience with uh, chat GPT and mm -hmm. watching all other people test that technology. And I think that speaks to that democratization simplicity, right? We're talking here about operators in the shop floor of a manufacturing plant. Not all of them will have a PhD that can interpret like the intricacies of a machine learning algorithm, but all of them can interact with a chatbot because they do it in their day-to-day -day lives anyways, right? So I think that's a really important point about thinking of the user and how to make it easy for them to adopt this technology. So I want to thank you guys for uh, having this great conversation with me. Um, it's great uh, having your insights and it's also super exciting to see what's possible in the space of uh, application of artificial intelligence in life science manufacturing. So thank you.